sounds true, and the New Roadmap Foundation present Transforming Your Relationship with Money with the late Joe Dominguez. And now to introduce the program, co-author of Your Money or Your Life, Vicki Robin. Greetings, and welcome to a very special listening experience. I'm Vicki Robin, co-author with Joe Dominguez of Your Money or Your Life. Joe died in 1997, but he lives on through these classic tapes of his last public seminars. Joe presented his day-long seminar, called Transforming Your Relationship with Money and Achieving Financial Independence, from 1980 through 1985, always to sold-out crowds. His combination of financial savvy, hard-hitting truth, humor, and compassion was a real winner. So much so that he decided to quit. Why? Well, Joe's concern was helping people to develop a clear relationship with money so that they would be released to their true calling and so that the earth would no longer be held hostage to the multiplying desires of the North American consumer. He wanted people to follow his nine-step program, not him. So, in 1986, he pulled together the best of the best from all his seminars, and we created this audio cassette workbook course. From 1986 through 1992, we sold the tape course via mail order. In a sense, the tape course traveled so Joe could stay home. By the late 1980s, a media buzz had begun about this man who lived on $500 a month and gave away tens of thousands of dollars a year. In 1990, a book agent read one of those articles, and in it she saw a bestseller in Joe's approach to money. So in 1992, Your Money or Your Life was published with myself as co-author, and the rest, as they say, is history. Upwards of three-quarters of a million books have sold in six languages. Who would have imagined that a kid who grew up on welfare in Spanish Harlem would end up retiring, albeit on a modest income, at age 31, and helping so many people make the most of their money and their lives. The road from Harlem to being a best-selling author was long, rich, and varied. An eighth-grade teacher recognized that his special genius was being wasted on barrio challenges and got him a place at one of New York's high schools for the very intellectually gifted. Then, after studying everything from engineering to English lit at City College, Joe ended up on Wall Street. His goal? was to understand money. Having known both poverty and seen the relative wealth of his high school classmates' families, he was certain about one thing. Money had nothing to do with happiness. Working from 9 to 5 to 65 and climbing someone else's ladder of success could not be the right roadmap for a good life. On Wall Street, Joe worked first as a messenger, then as a stock trader, and ultimately learned from the real pros that success with money entailed an attitude of detachment and a larger vision for one's life. He used to tell of being called into the office of a legendary investment fund manager, a man who had been following Joe's weekly newsletter for institutional investors. The elderly man opened the conversation by talking about philosophy and spirituality, about the Tao, T-A-O, not the Dow, D-O-W. So Joe spent nine years on Wall Street and, from salary alone, saved enough money to retire just before his 31st birthday. His goal at that time was to travel around the world and to seek the spiritual Dow. After several years and many miles, he concluded that the greatest of life's adventures is the journey to the heart of love and a life of service. While he was willing to do anything to help others, and did many things for about a decade, what people really wanted from him was to know what he so obviously knew about money. Why was he free while they were wage slaves? How could he live so well on so little while they struggled in vain to make ends meet? Could they do what he did? By now it's 1980, and I had been working with Joe for a number of years, having put his program into effect and become financially self-sufficient myself. So, together with the rest of our team of companions, we began producing the seminar. In the proverbial basement of a church, 
and sweating out a 102-degree fever, Joe first presented Transforming Your Relationship with Money and Achieving Financial Independence to several dozen people. Since we didn't need the money, and the nonprofit project we were working with did, we donated all the proceeds of that seminar to them. Thus, an ethic and a tradition began. For two decades, all proceeds from all of our educational programs have been donated to worthy causes. As volunteers, our pay has been the service we're providing and the contribution we're making to thousands of people's lives. By 1984, we formed the New Roadmap Foundation as a way to produce our educational programs and to hold the proceeds until we found just the right project to fund. To date, we've given away nearly three-quarters of a million dollars to hundreds of young, mostly volunteer nonprofit groups dedicated to leaving this world in better shape than they found it. So, while Joe is gone, his legacy lives on now in the lives of millions. While Your Money or Your Life presents similar material, the opportunity to hear it from the horse's mouth, as it were, is literally priceless. You are about to meet the man who invented the program that made such a difference to so many. The guy who had his wall chart taped to the pull-out typewriter shelf at his desk on Wall Street so he could contemplate his journey to financial freedom when no one was looking. The man who walked away from being a rising star with promises of partnership in a Wall Street firm because he had his eye on a different star entirely. Keep in mind as you listen that these seminars were given between 1980 and 85, when interest rates were at a peculiar historical high. So if Joe says 10% or 12%, just have that and let go of any longing for the good old days of great returns. Besides such specific data, the essential program is unchanged and unchanging. It is perennial wisdom about money. Keep in mind as well that you will get the most benefit from these tapes by doing the workbook exercises as you listen to each side of each tape. After you do that, go ahead and reinforce the learning by listening again while you commute or jog or relax after work. Many people re-listen to the whole series every six months or so to keep them headed toward financial clarity and financial independence. I hope you enjoy meeting Joe and that you are inspired by this program to truly transform your relationship with money. And now, before you begin listening to this series, please take a moment to answer the preview questions for Session 1 on page 9 in your workbook. Then, when you are ready, continue the program. Recorded at seminars in front of a live audience in Vancouver, Canada, and Seattle, Washington, in 1986. Here's Joe Dominguez. I gotta tell you, it's pretty strange to be sitting up here looking down on all of you, half blinded, so I can barely make you out, booming through the room, but that's the way it is. I should also tell you that I am not a professional seminar giver, or as I said one time, seminarian. Professional is defined by simply somebody who takes money for what they do. And since I don't take money for what I do, I can't be a professional anything. But more important than that, um, what's happening up here is not an act. It's not me doing a, uh, a show for you in order to sell you on something, either a product or an idea or um, somehow impress you with how together I am, or how clever I am, or how witty I am. I'm not a performer. I've purposely avoided, in spite of doing this in this format for some six years now, I purposely avoided learning how to do it. 
Because what I want you to get is that I'm me, I'm just me, sharing a lot of information with you. And it's important to remember that because there's gonna be times that you will feel something about me. I'm being offensive, or I'm being arrogant, or I'm really being uh, pushy, or whatever. Uh, that may be true, I don't know. I'm just doing what I do. But the important thing might be that you get that something's coming up for you around whatever it is I'm saying. You see, this is one of the most, if not the most, loaded topic in our world. Money. Psychologist after psychologist has written about the fact that we have more of a load around money than anything else, that more relationships are broken up out of financial discussion than out of sexual discussion, or lack of. We have more taboos around this subject than any other. Any realm, any domain that has that kind of a load and that bunch of taboos around it and in which there is no really clear early education, any domain that, that has those fundamental factors, you got to be screwed up. <laughs> you got to be screwed up around it. Very often I'll start a seminar by looking down on some fellow in the front row and say, excuse me, sir, uh, how big is yours? <laughs> how big is your paycheck? That's all I'm asking. But isn't that the most personal question you can ask of a man? How big is your paycheck? When I was professional, when I was doing financial consultation on Wall Street, the client would have been prepared as to what data to bring in for the official ta -da, consultation meeting at 100 bucks an hour. The day they came in, it would take, by the clicking clock, about 20 minutes before they finally got around to answering the most basic question that I had first asked, and that is, how much do you make? I got rich at that time, off of the taboo aspect of it. <laughs> but it clued me in that, boy, we really do have a load. Now, nobody here feels that they have a load around it. Because if you felt you had a load around it, you wouldn't have a load around it. I mean, you know, if you were really in touch with the fact that maybe your paradigm, your model for the whole subject of money is screwed up, you would have done something about it. So it's not insulting to say that it's a good likelihood that we do all have had or have a rather distorted perspective around money. Now, I lucked out. I lucked out in, in that I was brought up in the ghetto. Piss poor. And then from there, I was sent to a, a special high school outside of the ghetto. Because mainly I wanted to learn something more than, you know, knife fighting 101. <laughs> but now I had a very interesting contrast. I had the, the model that I grew up with of really scrabbling for an existence and, boy, to, to try to get those bucks, anything, any way that you, you could, get those bucks. And people were miserable. Even those that could get those bucks, usually through illicit activities, were still miserable. Then I went to this very middle class school, and people were still miserable. But they already had the bucks. <laughs> that was very fortunate. Because it got me a thinking. How come? Then I began to look at 
what kind of education did I get around this very fundamental stuff? I mean, from the age of two or three or four, you're already dealing with it, whether it's to spend your allowance or whatever, but where did I get an education about it? Or what kind of education did I get? Now, most of you, when you answered that, that question in the, on the worksheet, realized that it was mm, kind of pretty primitive stuff. Um, don't spend it all in one place as you got your allowance or you know, all kinds of stuff. But might I suggest that we got it even earlier than that, that we began to get our programming around money even earlier than that? Some say maybe even in the womb. But early, pre-verbal, it's likely that you overheard things like, well, we can't afford to get Junior that new toy, or you know, she can't have that doll, it's too expensive, or even more basic than that, you realize that your daddy, or nowadays I guess it would be your mommy also, weren't around because of something to do with money. So you were deprived of that parent's nurturance to a high degree for many hours of the day, and it had something to do with money. And then the further programming that came in usually was negative, usually was relating to a lack. We can't afford that. Not very many people grow up early on in an environment of real comfort around money. Now, I don't mean excess. I don't mean wealth. You see, we're going to have to be making that distinction because people growing up in wealthy environments can have just as much discomfort around money. You know, what's happening with the stock market, uh, whether the house in, you know, whatever wealthy suburb, the second house is being broken into, or what the security uh, precautions are necessary, or the rolls uh, just got a dent, or whatever. Uh, it can be just as upsetting around money and negative. We got that early on in most cases. Then we progressed and we had some kind of courses in high school. But was that the nitty gritty truth, basic neutral information around money? Or was that filtered through a home economics teacher who herself was going on strike for more money or you know, wondering where the hell the next uh, you know, bill was, how was it, it was gonna get paid or whatever. She had her own stuff around it. So how can you expect to have clear information coming from a source like that? Or you may have had information about budgeting or how to you know, make out a check or like that, but in terms of the real, the essence, no, I don't think you got it there either. I certainly didn't. Now let's go even deeper. Even if we had gotten a very detailed, I mean months of detailed information about the nature of money and the nature of our interaction with money, what would be the model, the paradigm that it was based on? When was our paradigm created? The model that we function under, economic model, personal economic model. When did we first really invent nine to five till you die? <laughs> That's right. The beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we were first putting through a transcontinental railway, when there was a frontier to be won, what's changed since then in terms of our personal interaction with money? Not much. You know, if you were driving, if you were a newcomer to Vancouver and you were driving around with a street map and constantly getting lost. 16th Street doesn't go where it should go, or 
or there's a dead end, or there's water where there should be more land, or... <laughs> you might be smart enough to look in the lower left-hand corner of that street map and see that it says Seattle. <laughs> you'd feel pretty dumb driving around Vancouver with a Seattle street map. And you'd be pretty quick about catching something is wrong. Or you look in that lower left-hand corner and you see it's still, it does say Vancouver, but then you're even smarter and you check out those funny M's and X's and V's and L's and it says 1884. <laughs> well, I don't think you're going to find your way around Vancouver with an 1884 street map. Aren't we in that same situation? Aren't we still functioning with a model of personal finances that was basically instituted 100, 150 years ago and that we've come to accept as a total norm? That's the way it is. We don't question it. That's why paradigm, even though it's gotten overused a lot in recent years, is still a better word, really, than context or model, because the interesting thing about paradigm is that it's not questioned. It is so known, taken for granted, totally accepted, that's the way it is. <laughs> Period. The world's flat, we all know that. <laughs> How stupid to think otherwise. I mean, everybody, with a few minor exceptions, a couple of nuts, but in the 14th century, everybody knew, capital K, knew, in their bones knew, that the world was flat. That was not a questionable topic. It didn't sit around the coffee shops and debate whether the world was round or not. You didn't do that kind of mental masturbation around that. It was a given, it was a known. So of course, it took some weird people to begin to examine that. Usually with some kind of external stimulus or catalyst. Have we really examined our basic assumptions around money? Of course we have. We work with it every day. Well, of course they had. They walked on the earth every day. They didn't know anybody who had fallen off or came close to it. This is the key, is our stuckness in thinking that we know, that that's the way it is, that there is no other way. Just in terms of our personal interaction with it, Part of today is about making hamburger out of all sacred cows, especially our own, to identify those sacred cows and chop them up, because they are the only things holding us back from a reality-based relationship with money. We do not, the working assumption, the starting point is that most of us have not had a reality-based relationship to money. If you know the answer to this because you've seen it somewhere, don't share it with your neighbor. Spend uh, 30 seconds or so solving this. Nine circles. Connect those nine circles in your mind. Connect those nine circles with three straight lines without lifting the chalk off the blackboard. Connect the nine circles with three straight lines without lifting the chalk off the blackboard. Just work on it visually, mentally. When you think you've got it and you didn't know it from some other place, raise your hand. Good. So how many got it? I found, I counted two before. Good. 
Good. Two people in the room. Good. What in the heck is the laughter? What was complex about this? There's no trick to it. I venture to say that the average IQ in this room is probably above average. The simplicity is startling. Embarrassment, right? Embarrassment. So it keeps us from getting stuff. This problem has been studied by psychologists for years. And two factors keep people from getting it. One, you drew a box around it. You limited it. You limited yourself in relation to it. There's no box around it. You drew the box. You made it up. You make up a lot of stuff like that. You make up a lot of boxes. One, two. You didn't hear me say circle. A circle has dimension. You saw or heard a dot. Infinitesimal, no dimension. So there isn't a top, a middle, and a bottom to a dot. So you couldn't go outside of the box you put something that wasn't there, and you took away something that was there. It's dimension. It's a superb example. But we only do that for puzzles on blackboards. We don't do that around money. No, that's too important. That's different from a puzzle on a blackboard. What if? What if we relate to money in exactly that way, limiting our vision of it, our perception of it, putting stuff in that isn't there, taking stuff out that is there? Everybody's got to make a living, right? How many people here believe that everybody's got to make a living? Raise your hands. Everybody's got to make a living. Yeah. Right, good. How many people have you seen that are making a living? <laughs> making a living? I thought that's what you were born with. I thought that came natural. I thought that was a ticket. Now, if there is somebody making a living, when they come home from that eight or ten hours of making a living, they're full of life. They're all alive. They're just bouncing around, really feeling alive. Wow. Or, or they are really beautiful beings that are contributing this aliveness to the world. Okay? They really know that for those eight hours, they're gifting the world. Those people come home maybe tired and not quite as wired, but fulfilled, rich in the highest. They've been making a living. One or the other, either you're making it for yourself and you're all filled with aliveness, or you've been making it for the world and giving it out to the world, and therefore you come home just absolutely fulfilled. <laughs> either one of those would qualify for making a living. Now, I'm not saying anything about your job. You may be enjoying your job, that's fine, that's good. You may feel your job is making a contribution, that's good. I'm just saying that look at our languaging, Maybe most of us are not making a living. Maybe we're making a dying. <laughs> we come home, oh God, oh gee, what a day. Oh, oh what's on television today? Oh, <laughs> That's living? Not my definition. How about the adversarial relationship we have with money? I mean, there had to be a book published not too long ago, a little thing called Money is Your Friend. I mean, that's a stupid title, isn't it? 
No, not if you think about the fact that, yeah, it may be an adversarial relationship with money. One of anger and conflict. Getting both ends to meet, you know, and oh God, the bills gotta pay the bills, and you know, squeezing that dollar till the ego grins. <laughs> Violent. I squeeze everything I can out of a buck. Ah. If you were a dollar, would you hang around you? <laughs> Yeah, the Industrial Revolution has been won. For better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, the West has been conquered, for better or for worse. The railroad not only has been put through, it's obsolete. <laughs> <coughs> but it was out of that, that nine to five till you die, Everybody's got to make a living. Another day, another dollar. All of that. This concludes session one. Please take the necessary time to answer the review questions for session one on page 15 in your workbook. When you are ready to continue, Answer the preview questions for session two on page 19, and then continue listening. You know, there's been a bunch of anthropological studies that say that the caveman from caveman times until, I think, a couple hundred years ago, average workday was three hours a day. At your hunter-gatherers, three hours a day, and they had the provisions they needed. I lived in a village in Mexico, a very primitive, fish, quote unquote, primitive fishing village, virtually no contact with the outside world. Level of, quote unquote, civilization was about 300 years back. Christianity hadn't even made it in there. It was still witch doctor. No uh, internal combustion engines or anything like that. About three hours a day. About three hours a day of labor throwing a net out in a lagoon, enough fish to then trade some of the fish with rice and beans that, was, that came in from the mainland. The purpose of the Industrial Revolution was to put ourselves out of work, have machines do it. Now, when machines replace us, we bitch. And the unions raise a stink. But that was the whole idea. Is he saying that, that there should be unemployment? I'm not saying there should be. I'm saying that it's a fact of life. Now, why is that a bad? It's wonderful how we'll just, whatever we don't like, we make that the bad. Because we don't like it, therefore it's bad. Unemployment is bad. Who says? I'll be talking a lot about 11th Commandments. Those are the ones that, uh, it was very difficult carrying down the three rocks. He left one of them up, up there. I have it on good authority. And then that third rock that Moses left behind are listed 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, etc. Now the interesting thing is, even though they're not publicized, most of us know them. We got them. We got them stuck in there. Unemployment is bad is definitely in there. Who says? Who says? For a lot, of, a lot of marriage counselors will say that when the wage earner, when it's a one wage earner household, loses his job, one of two things happens. Either because his identity is so tied up in the job, things really go crazy, and that's when drinking and wife beating and all those other horrendous things occur, or there's a dramatic improvement in the relationship because now there's time to put into that relationship. 
and has to do with the maturity of the people involved, but that it's an opportunity, not just a crisis. A hundred years ago, what did the planet need? Theoretically, I don't want to get into you know, theological arguments here, but it could be said that the solution to the planet's problems as best seen from the viewpoint of 100 years ago, those solutions were material. We needed transportation because we had vast expanses to tame, to farm, to you know, traverse, to spread out the populations. So we needed transportation. We needed communication, at least electronically speaking. We've always needed communication, still do, but electronic or electrical. So we needed telegraphy. We needed trains. Supposedly we needed, in order to maintain peace in the world, we needed machinery of war, supposedly, at least from the best perceptions of that time to stop the uh, horrible things that were going on in the world, we would create machinery to stop those horrible things. We needed ways of creating clothing at a fast rate, other than sewing it by hand. We needed the machinery to farm effectively. Horse and plow wasn't making it too effectively for the population that expanded. So a hundred years ago, for many of the world's problems, physical, material solutions were valid. For that, it needed a lot of manpower, person power, to create that machinery. What are the problems facing the world today? Are they labor-intensive, materially solved? That's interesting. Do we need more stuff? Let's question that one. Do we need more stuff in the world? Or is there enough stuff, but we're not distributing it appropriately? Looking at the planet as a whole. Do we need more food stuff? Or have we actually created enough food stuff, but it's stored over here and unavailable over there? So it's not creating more stuff, but distribution of stuff. Now furthermore, we're running out of the materials with which to create more stuff. We're running out of a lot of resources. So it isn't about making more stuff. Do we need more bomb stuff? No. Do we need more houses? Well, in the US there's something like 1.6 dwelling units, buildings for each family unit that lives separately because of vacation homes and second homes and all that stuff. And people are still doing more clear cutting and building more houses you ever notice that the people that build houses don't realize that they're the ones that create the clear cuts? You know, you know I, I sometimes think that people think that logging companies stockpile all the logs just to be nasty. But a lot of urban folk don't realize that it is their penchant for building houses or yuck, I don't want any other plastic furniture, I want only real wood furniture. In other words, demand which I gather is little of nowadays, and thus creating more problems. You see, we seem to have too much stuff in the logging uh, industry. We have too much wood around, too much stuff. How many of the world's problems are soluble by the creation of more stuff? Not too many. Are our heroes Nowadays, the stuff creators, the Carnegies and Rockefellers and so on, those were the heroes of a day. 
No, our Mother Teresa's and Desmond Tutu's and so on seem to be the heroes of the day. People involved in service, in compassion, in sharing of themselves, in serving the planet. There's a lot of need for that. That's something needed and wanted by the planet. So 100 years ago, stuff. And so we created this idea of total employment because there was all that stuff to manufacture and there was an endless supply of resources as we thought. Not now. The materials, the supplies, dwindling. The need for that stuff, dwindling. You know, why does advertising have to exist other than to create the demand for stuff? I'm not saying that stuff is bad. I'm, I'm wearing stuff and we're sitting in stuff and I'm talking to stuff and, you know, stuff. And I'm writing with stuff. Nothing wrong with stuff, but is that, maybe that's already passe. Maybe that's, all right, we got it. It's done. The stuff making phase is over. And so now people are talking about information revolution. We need more information, or do we need to use the information we got? What if the solutions to the world's problems, or possibly for the survival of the world, simply is not a paying job? Boy, then we'll really be in bad shape. Because, you know, one of the oldest axioms in business world is that to be successful, you've got to provide a product that is needed and wanted by the public. You've heard that. Maybe that's not true. You know, maybe Detroit in 1974 really thought that what the public needed and wanted was humongous cattle boat cars that did about nine miles per gallon. To their best vision, that's what they thought. They, they're not that dumb. You know, they, they manufacture what the public wants, and that's what they were churning out at that time. And then along comes a little political foo somewhere, and that ain't what the public wants anymore. To be successful, you've got to provide a product that is needed and wanted by the public. Is that antiquated? Let's redefine some of the words. Let's look at some of the words. What is success nowadays? Is success purely material success? Amazing the number of um, surveys have been taken about uh, what, what do people really want. Ever increasing percentages are saying that it isn't in the material realm, that their experience of success lies. A hundred years ago it was. A hundred years ago that's what people would say. Success is, you know, having a thousand dollars. A hundred years ago. Now we call it having a million dollars, right? So maybe we need to substitute another word for success. Let's try fulfilled. To be fulfilled, you know, an experience of happiness, of wholeness, of fulfillment. Interpret that any way you want. To be fulfilled, you've got to provide a product. But I was just saying, we don't need stuff. So, a service, because it's the idea of serving rather than shoving it down their throat, or you better buy this, or, you know, Coke is the thing, or whatever. Advertising campaigns to create the demand, it's just you serve that need. Good. So, fulfillment and serving, and now public. By public, is it just the consuming public? Well, hold it, Detroit provided what the consuming public wanted at the time, and it didn't work. It wanted the giant cars. Okay, so maybe the public has taken a larger face now. Maybe it's a whole planet. Maybe we're that interrelated that it isn't just your local marketing public, that the public is the planet. Had we, had Detroit 
taken into consideration the planetary situation and oil depletions and so on, it may have shifted to more efficient cars, but it was dealing with public small instead of the whole. So then that becomes fulfillment. To be fulfilled, you must provide a service that is needed and wanted by the planet. So we don't have to throw that out. We just have to modify a few of the words from one of the oldest business axioms. And maybe that'll work. I mentioned paradigms before and the flat world. We have had an event in our own time, a couple of them, but an event in our own time that possibly is as deep and all pervasive an impact as was, say, Columbus coming back and saying, guess what, guys, it's round. And that was the pictures of Earth sent back from space. Everybody has that picture in their consciousness. That classic poster. Now, maybe you even saw it on TV as it was happening. But that picture maybe is as powerful and all-pervasive a <coughs> instrument of shifting our worldview as the realization that the world was round in the first place. The realization we're just a rock floating in space. Remember that next time you get into a tiff about something or all uptight about I'm just this you know microscopic dot in this rock going through space. What am I, why am I making such a big deal out of this? <laughs> and the magnificence of that. And what it did to the astronauts. It blew them it blew them out of the air, out of the water. <laughs> I mean, you had astronauts becoming poets and world servers. So it was impactful to them. It's been impactful to a lot of people. Our interconnectedness, our planetary interconnectedness. That shifts the rules. That's a new ball game. Just the same way the round world created a new ball game. And a lot of people say, hey, that gave such a stimulus, such a, uh, a spark to the Renaissance. Renaissance could have petered out. Okay. But there was something about that, that expansive vision, that limitlessness that the round world gave to the consciousness of people then. Now we have that consciousness of interconnectedness, of all of us being on this one ball in space. And then we have that hammered home by nuclear winter. We have that hammered home by, hey, somebody sets it off, maybe all of us go up. Ain't no win-lose in this one. That hammers home our interconnectedness. And then we have an event like Live Aid. Two and a quarter billion people, close to half of the planet's population, linked up with the same purpose, ostensibly the same purpose. Because even if you were just there to watch the rock performers, the impact of it. And I've talked to a lot of kids about it. And they, they got that it was about ending hunger on this planet. Two and a quarter billion, half of the population linked up with one purpose in mind. Transcending all geographic barriers. That's never happened before in history. So here in a 15 year span, we've got it. Stimuli, impactful stimuli of that sort. It's setting up whole new rules to the game. On this axis is money spent. On this axis is fulfillment. Fulfillment is going up, money spent going out there. In the beginning, <laughs> We spent some money and got a humongous amount of fulfillment. We spent some money and got a huge amount of fulfillment. Yeah, 
We get food. We get clothing. We get shelter. They took some money. So we spent some money and got an enormous amount of fulfillment, mainly our own survival. So each time we spent some more money, each increment gave us more fulfillment. Very linear. More money spent, more fulfillment. 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 We continued that. More money spent, more fulfillment. More money spent, more fulfillment. More money spent, more fulfillment. This is comforts. And it was not quite linear, but the more money we spent, the more fulfillment we got. Now, that occurred for you spending your first allowance. That occurred to you paying your way when you were in college with daddy's money. But that occurred to you when you went out and had your first apartment. Over and over again, that has occurred in your life. That has happened. It may not have occurred, you know, like thought of, but it happened in your life that the more money you spent, the more fulfillment you got. Obviously. And a very linear. You spend more, you got more fulfillment. Two popsicles are better than one popsicle. You know, two candy bars gave you twice the fulfillment of one candy bar. Always has happened. And even in the comfort zone, yeah, that more money you spent, Felt good, you got more fulfillment. More money you spent, 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 you... Well, I'll spend some more. More money you spent... Well, I need to get a bigger one. More money that you spent... It's always worked. More money than you spent. There must be something wrong with the one I bought. More money you spent, the more... No, the less. No, it can't be. More money I spent, the more... Whoa! More money I... R.I.P. Rest in peace. The end of the line. No fulfillment at the end of the line. We're not going to go into theology. But wait a minute, what happened here? We were absolutely right. More money we spent, the more fulfillment. More money we spent, more fulfillment. Then all of a sudden, something happened. But we never saw it happen. We never paid attention. We never caught it. So we had comforts up to here, and then we had some peak here of luxuries, and then it started to go down, but we never saw it. The name of the game is Catch That Peak. <laughs> That's what all of today is about, learning how to catch that peak. You better clap. It can make all the difference in the world because it's about fulfillment. It's about realizing where that relationship between money spent and fulfillment peaks out. Because what are we after? Spending more money or are we after fulfillment? We'll be doing a lot with this curve. This is a fulfillment curve. Catching that peak. How come we don't notice when we go over the top? Because the programming is so deep. You, you, you know, that's the way you train anybody. More of this, more fulfillment, more payoff, more payoff, more payoff, more payoff. All right. Story to demonstrate the difference between humans and rats. <laughs> you take a rat and you put him in a maze. In this maze are four tunnels. When the rat gets hungry, it begins to explore the tunnels. It goes down tunnel number one, nothing. Down two, nothing. Down three, nothing. Down four, wow, the most gorgeous hunk of cheese he's ever seen. Scarfs it down, comes back out. <laughs> Next time it's hungry. 
Runs down tunnel number two, tunnel number three, tunnel number one, tunnel number four, and there's the cheese. Wow, great. Eats it, comes back out. Next time it's hungry, it's learning, down three, no, down four, there's the cheese. Next time it's hungry, straight down four. Next time it's hungry, straight down four. Next time it's hungry, straight down four, always cheese. Now comes the switch in the experiment. Okay? Runs down tunnel number four, no cheese. Whoa! Backs right out. Runs down tunnel number four, again. No cheese. Checks it all the way back out. Still no cheese. One, two, three, four. Runs down four, checks it out. Still no cheese, comes back out. Now, here's the difference between rats and humans. Because that rat is now going to check out tunnel number one, tunnel number two, number three. Humans keep on running down tunnel number four, tunnel number four, tunnel number four. It's always worked this way. See, to be happy, you gotta be married. To be happy, you gotta be married. To be happy, you gotta be. To be happy, you gotta have more money. To be happy, you gotta have more money. To be happy, it doesn't matter. You see, this is always it. See, tunnel number four. Spend more for more fulfillment. Rats are only interested in cheese. We're interested in being right. <laughs>
of ballerina, then who's going to be driving you to do the exercises or reminding you that it's exercise time or anything else? Nobody, you! You'll be dancing down the streets. You'll be thinking ballerina, feeling, tasting ballerina-ness. It's an is-ness. Is, be, be, is. You is a ballerina. <laughs> then of course you're gonna do the exercises. Of course you're gonna keep the body in trim. Of course. What else does a ballerina do? <laughs> and then you'll have the agreement in the world. Same thing with money. It's not about having the money. It's about being clear with money. It's about being at peace with money. It's about being intelligent in your use of, in the flow of money in your life. Then you will automatically do intelligent things. And then you will have whatever you set out to have. Call it financial independence or call it having, you know, a big boat in the dock or whatever. But it's got to flow from that direction. Look at how much in your life you've been flowing from the have direction. In order to be happy, I have to have a husband or wife. In order to be happy, I have to have a divorce. In order to be happy, I have to have another kid. In order to be happy, I gotta get rid of this other kid. In order to be happy, I have to have a million bucks. In order to be happy, I've gotta figure out what to do with this million bucks. Over and over again, we go at it from have. It doesn't work. I've not seen it work. In order to be happy, I have to have a good relationship. That's one of the best ones. How about backwards? That's backwards. Be happy. Then you'll have a good relationship. <laughs> Come from that. Nothing you're going to have is going to give you peace, fulfillment, whatever. It's who you are. That's a starting point. We have had that one backwards a little bit, huh? It's a great exercise. Go through life looking at your, your actions and just your verbiage, your, your languaging. If I had this, then I would be, you know. Just the way it is. Just happens to be one of those things. How about another way that we have it all backwards? For the draftsman here, ground. <laughs> ground of being, we'll call it here. How do we move from our beingness into reality, into the material world? And you know what? This is not a course in metaphysics. Really is not. I struggle for the words. If a word that I use offends, put a translator, you know, flip on your translator and find one that fits for you. But I think we can agree that there is a level of our being, of our consciousness, call it, or who we are. <laughs> you know, there is good languaging for it, unless you get into some metaphysical or spiritual or religious structure. But how do we come from that lifeness into interaction. Most often, we enter from this into life, reality, at the level of physical. And since it's a money seminar, we'll call it that. Physical, bucks. Then, we may develop or look at or experience, what can we call it, the mental function? It becomes an idea or a thought, or we think about it. It, it is already established. Then we have some feelings. The emotional realm enters into the equation. Finally, for some folks, they begin to pay attention to a realm that seems to transcend these, which they can call life, consciousness, spirit, whatever. 
It's not a very stable structure the way I've drawn it, is it? <laughs> Pyramids don't like being stood on their points. <laughs> they have a nasty habit of tilting over. Well, we handle that quite easily. We use something called props. <laughs> Now, if this is relationship, it's much easier to talk about this in terms of relationship. You know, we most often approach relationship, whether you want to admit it or not, a lot of folks, some people, it has been known to happen. <laughs> that some people enter relationship at the sexual realm. Wow, she's cute, he's a hunk, whatever. It's been known to happen. <laughs> And then they may develop a compatibility of mind. Sharing ideas, it's fun to talk with each other. And then it might be that there's a, an emotional component that enters into it. And there's nice feelings together. And in rare cases, it may, the relationship may evolve into what, what we call a co-creative relationship where it's uh, a spiritual component, where it's something uh, about what we're doing together is about serving others instead of imploding, we're exploding with our relationship. Uh, maybe, in, in, in a few cases. But it's generated that same way. What are the names of the props that we create? Well, uh, let's get married. <laughs> That's a prop. Okay. A legal certificate. Uh, let's have a baby. Uh, let's get a big house. Let's get another car. What we need is longer vacations. Uh, the reason we're not getting along is uh, because we need a second car. Uh, <laughs> we need an ivy-covered uh, cottage. Two by fours all over the place to hold a basically unstable structure. <laughs> and in our relationship to money, while it's less easy to, to give humorous analogs, it's the same. <laughs>